Hi, this is Stacy. Oh, wow, hi. How are you? You know what I was thinking? Montenegro. Yeah, Montenegro in August. Nobody goes to Montenegro in August. <laughs> Just us. Yeah. Want to go? What do you think? My mother could always, she was always pretty coordinated. You know, she was always the organist. She was the organist who could play, you know, the piano with one hand, the organ with the other, get the pedal going, talk to people all at the same time, yeah. So we're at the movies last night, right? And the movies are like, you know, it's like $12 where I went to, but you know what? Now we snuck in. Uh-huh. Grand Hotel style, you know who that is? Grand Hotel? Uh-oh. Greta and Garbo, they're both five letters. Which one is it? Well, you know, I had some dental work done the other day and I gotta tell you there's something right now in, the, in my tooth that I just can't get out. I had a crown. It was just on the, on the top. Uh-huh. Right on the top there. Oh, it looks good, it looks good, yeah. It looks really good. But I know I want to change my inner diet too. Always. Uh, uh, uh. I have a very long uvula. All right. Well, about I was there, and then you know who else we saw? Then we see um, Justin Timberlake. He's all right. I just got to fix something right here. Hold on a second. Yeah, he's all right. He was, he drives a white Range Rover. I don't know what his, you know, he might be hosting the Oscars next year. He's been in talks, uh-huh. Oh, much better. Finally, I did my foot here. Oh, and anyway, oh God, they have another damn text. Hold on one second. Yes, this is Stacy. Oh, are you really? That's the best thing you can do. That's the best thing you can do for your face. Uh-huh, damp, warm towel, yeah. It's the best thing for your pores. Oh, I do it whenever I can. Lavender scent. Uh-huh. I gotta turn. Mm. Oh, look, I can turn with my elbows. I can't believe I could do that. <laughs> oh. Stacy here. Yes, I wanted to tell you, I went to that yoga class. Oh my God, I, I learned a new position. The pretzel. Oh, well, you can even do it when you're driving. It's called a pretzel, yeah. Well, you have to maneuver a little bit, getting up here, and then you just like drive with your back and, and it works your back at the same time. This is Stacy. Oh, Pammy, Pammy, hi. Great, ready for your driving lesson? Oh, great, Pammy. Oh, this is gonna be so great. You're gonna learn how to drive. It'll give you such great independence, yes. Stacy, I think I know Stacy, right? Some of the times we've been Stacy. I had to go there. It's just simply because we're talking about the theme of distracted, and that's the first thing that we think about. Most of us is distracted driving because it's so common today. You know, uh, no nobody in this room, I think, is can say that they've never been slightly distracted or to change this or do this or, you know, my whole thing is I drop a french fry between the seat. You know how hard it is to get a french fry when you're, when you're eating it, the drops between the seat. It's almost impossible to find that sucker while it's down there. But 400, and it's really not a funny thing, 421,000 people in the United States get hurt from accidents caused by a distracted driver. And that is so low because who's going to admit that they were trying to get the french fry that was down between the seat when they hit the person in front of them. But 
And here's the thing is that we're going to pick on 20-somethings. We haven't got too many of them in the room. But, but if you're 20-something, 20 27% of these accidents happen by 20-somethings, and they don't even track what teenagers do. It's got to be more than that, right? So we'll pick on them. Now, kind of connected to that is the whole thing with, you know, as we're talking about distracted, the first thing I thought about was distracted driving, and obviously the, the smartphone or a cell phone is really added into that a whole lot. So then just thinking about non-driving distracted living, and the smartphone's got to come up top, you know, and uh, a lot of us have got smartphones, but there was an article uh, a couple months back through Relevant Magazine, which Relevant Magazine is a Christian magazine aimed at 20-something, so obviously I read it, you know. And, and they, they came out with um, the thing about addicted to your, your smartphone and making the point that smartphones have become almost an addiction and that they have become the center of our lives. And here's seven things. Some of these are pretty good. Uh, number one, you know you're addicted to your smartphone when you look at your phone while you're bored in church. Yeah, that'll slow that down the day a little bit. Okay. Uh, you look at your phone as a crutch in awkwardly and, and socially awkward situations. So like you're, you're at a party or something, your friends aren't there, and so what do you do? You get out your smartphone and you pretend to be really busy. You know, you got something really urgent that's coming in because you just don't want to talk to people that you don't know, number two. Um, number three, all of your alone time is spent on your phone. I thought this one was really good. When, when you're, you have a moment of solitude, when no one else is around, when you know, you're waiting at a restaurant or you, know, you got a break of some kind or maybe you got an evening, you, you spend the whole time on your smartphone surfing the net or looking at your social media, saying you might be addicted. Uh, number four, you consistently have zero new items in your Facebook news feed. Those of you that are on Facebook knows what know what this means. It means you're checking Facebook every minute of every day. You know, it's just nothing comes up because you're checked all your notifications. Uh, number five, it's the last thing you see before bed and the first thing you look at in the morning. Ooh. Your phone's by your bedside and you say good night. You know, check check Facebook one more time. Okay, nothing there. I can go to sleep first thing in the morning. Uh, anything on Twitter, anything on Facebook. Number six, you check for social media updates at traffic lights. Well, now that's really meddling. I, you know, this, this really is over the line because traffic lights obviously are a break in life where we should be checking our phones to see if anything's, I'm being sarcastic. And number, number seven, uh, th this one's a little, you know, obscure, uh, but some of you will relate to airplane mode induces anxiety. <laughs> You got to go into airplane mode and you're just wondering what in the world am I missing? You know, it was an Alex Baldwin that was kicked off the plane because he was addicted to the, the phone game and they, he wouldn't stop playing it. So they just kicked him off the game. So I want us just to kind of own this today. It's, it's more and more difficult to retain someone's undivided attention because it's become normal for us to be distracted. I mean, now we consider silence to be very threatening. Really, silence is threatening to many of us. Distractions are, have now become the new normal of what life is about. And this is, this is what we're swimming in. This is what we're fighting constantly. Uh, and the lie is, is that we can multitask, that we can be completely focused on two things at the same time. Uh, that's impossible. It's impossible for us to have all of our attention in two places at once. It's physically impossible. But we can't have two things that are equally most important. You know, one can be the most and the other one can be somewhat important, but we can't have two things that are the most important. We can't give two things all of our attention at once and we can't really really listen to someone that's that's talking to us while we're texting or checking some something else and I mean this has just become the new normal for most of us so we don't have any problem if somebody's telling us a story for us to break off for a while and check something you know it's, it's, it's just the way life is anymore we think that we can do that but we really can't we're distracted even if being distracted feels normal 
it feels that way because it's become normal. It really isn't normal. Now, if we pay close attention as we read the Bible, uh, we see that Jesus had conversations and encounters with people where he invited and he challenged them to make a decision about him. Uh, For instance, uh, one day he went by a tax booth and and there was Matthew who was a tax collector. That meant that he had sold out to Rome. He'd become very rich. And what Jesus say to him, he said, come follow me. And so Matthew leaves his, his very lucrative vocation and goes and follows Jesus as a disciple. But Jesus challenged him with making a life decision right there. And he did the same thing with Peter and Andrew and James and John, two sets of brothers who were fishermen, and he called them to leave their families and to leave their hometowns and to come follow him. And Jesus was always doing that, always pushing people to make a decision. You couldn't just hang around him and encounter him and walk away and not be challenged to make a decision about him. I mean, uh, we we can go on. Uh, I mean, in every encounter that, that he makes, he had people were presented with what we would call today defining the relationship, you know, doing a DTR. And, and, and this is, you know, slang for that. And, and what it means to where does our relationship stand? And, and Jesus was always confronting people with that question and challenging them to define the relationship with him, one where he was, in fact, their Messiah, their Lord, and they became a follower. I think of, you know, like Zacchaeus uh, went that way. Nicodemus was that way, those of you that know Scripture pretty well. Uh, Rich young ruler, definitely that way. And, um, you know, he was always asking people to, uh, always pushing that question is, who do you say that I am? What are you going to do about it? And I think we're kind of uncomfortable with doing that ourselves, with defining relationships with other people, you know. We we don't just go up to somebody and say, hey, you want to be my best friend? You know, that's a little awkward and and social graces, you know, just say you can't do that kind of thing. So we just kind of wait and we pause and just kind of see how it works out. And, And either relationship gets better and improves and we get closer to each other or it just kind of evaporates and it goes away. But Jesus... I mean, he constantly did that. And I don't think anybody ever walked away from Jesus and goes and said, well, that was nice. That's a nice talk. He's, he's a great guy. I, I think I kind of like him. I, I, I may friend him. I don't know. You know, but he's, he's just really kind of just a neat guy at Jesus. He never gave him that option. He, he was always inviting them for, to, to be who God had destined them to be, but he was also challenging them to do that and his primary invitation was to follow him okay to learn from him to become like him and that's what it meant to be his follower and his disciple was to be with him so much that you learned who he was and what he believed and then you become the same thing and there was an evening dinner party um, we'd call it a dinner party uh, that's in the Bible that gives us a lot of insight into what it means to follow Jesus and how distractions can can get in the way. And it's a story of two ladies, their sisters. Um, they become close friends of Jesus. Their names are uh, Mary and Martha. And Jesus pushed them to define the relationship and what results is what we would call kind of an awkward moment. It's in Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now this passage is usually explained to be about personality types. This is what we always hear on this. I preached it that way. And I mean, it just looks so simple. We know Mary's and we know Martha's and there are Mary's in this room and there are Martha's in this room. and, and Mary is kind of the contemplative type. She's the reflective type, and she's quiet. And, I mean, there, 
the Mary's motto is, you know, don't do something, just stand there. <laughs> right? We can always wait. Don't rush into anything. And um, it's kind of boring that way. And they, they don't have... They don't have to help in the kitchen because they're always reflecting on something and they can read their Bibles and, you know, not sign up for everything at church and they can feel good about it. The Marthas, on the other hand, they have the standard motto is, you know, the motto um, is don't just stand there, do something. And I think they're kind of the original multitaskers, the Marthas on, and a lot of us in this room are Marthas. So we were born to do something, anything. I mean, it's... It's kind of like, you know, ready, fire, aim is, is how you go through life. You know, you just, just do something, even if it's wrong, you'll undo it and you'll try it again. And a lot of us are Marthas. And, you know, if you're Marthas, you can't really understand why we're here wasting all this time in church when I could just email you the sermon and you could read it or listen to it some other time, right, while you're doing something else. Why, why, you know, we could do something with this time besides just sit here and listen to him. And, and you know, Martha's usually go home after this story and they're a little upset with this because we just kind of feel like most of the time um, what we hear saying is that if you're a doer, well, you're just, you just don't love Jesus, you know, because uh, you go through life doing all this stuff and it's the Marys that are the contemplative type and they are really, you know, who Jesus loves. But us, well, we're just never quite going to get there. But, but this isn't about personality. I really don't think this is about personality at all. I mean, God <laughs> made you correctly, Marthas. If you're one of these guys that, uh, or girls that, you know, you love to do things and get things done, God made you just the way that you are. You aren't mismade. That, that's not what this is about at all. And, you know, Martha's don't have to try to be Mary's. And, and Mary, you, you can't become Martha. You know, you're, you're made just the way that you're supposed to be. And God is not a, against action. I mean, that's what kind of goes with his teaching, is that if we would just sit around more and do less, that we'd be more at the feet of Jesus and, and we would please him more. But, you know, God calls a lot of people to action, to do things. Um, the rich young ruler came to him. This one came to mind. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. You know this. And he says, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know, keep the commandments. He says, I've done all this. And then, then Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have give your money to the poor and come follow follow me three things right you talk about action sell all that you have <laughs> give your money to the poor come follow me he didn't say why don't you go home and pray about it for a month no he said go do these three things now and he went away sad jesus called all kinds of people to action right now he's not against action this is you know not about personalities are being reflective some of us struggle with being reflective but we love to act and others struggle with acting and we love to be reflective and the the body of Christ needs all those together uh, it's it's about a lot more than fixing a meal I think and I thought about this what if the story were about Peter and John the the two disciples and you know through the Gospels we learn about these a lot about these two guys and Peter he's definitely a Martha Peter's an action guy and John, well, John's pretty reflective, you know, and uh, Peter, he loves a good adventure. Uh, one day they were out on the lake, lake, and we'll do this in a couple of weeks, and uh, Jesus comes to them walking on the water, and Peter says, I want to do that. The other guys in the boat say, he's nuts, you know. He says, let me get out and walk on the water with you. You talk about an action kind of guy. And Jesus says, come on, if you got faith, and he gets out and he has faith, he walks on the water for a while. John, on the other hand, is, is very quiet in the Gospels and doesn't say a lot. And he's, he's much more reflective. He's young and he's quiet. He's kind of like Mary here. And uh, Peter, on the other hand, when it comes to a fight, boy, he's ready the night that Jesus is betrayed. Uh, Peter picks out a sword and he's going to fight. Uh, not John. After the resurrection, Peter says, I'm going fishing. <laughs> the rest of them follow. Now, Peter's like Martha and John. He's probably more like a Mary, but it's to whom, to, to Peter, that God uh, first reveals that he is, in fact, 
the Messiah, the Son of a living God, and it's Peter that becomes the leader of the church early on. Peter is the man on whom the, the, the mantle falls. He kind of takes Jesus' place as the leader in these disciples. God uses all personalities. God doesn't just use Mary's, but God uses all personalities. Now, this story is an example of how our, I think our Western eyes kind of miss a lot of what's going on in the culture. Uh, we, we see this story and we think that it's about work and it's about being lazy. At least half of us are a little confused because we think, well, Jesus kind of scolded Martha and that's me, so I think he picked the wrong side because if there weren't Marthas, there'd never be anything done in this world. We think that, you know, this, we leave this whole scripture and we're just still a little bit confused. But the reality is, is that we really can't get, I think, meaning here without a little bit more information. And so if we were reading this in the first century, I think we would see it a lot differently than the way we do in our 21st century Western eyes. And the first of the fact is that Jesus goes to this house and he stays at a guest at the home of two unmarried women. Now, they just didn't do that. This just is not done. I mean, you, you, you never, two unmarried women don't take a male guest and his friends into her home, okay, in first century Jewish life. You just don't do that. And, you know, we, we first need to, to look at this, you know, just a little bit. Uh, and a rabbi, Jesus is, after all, the rabbi. A rabbi would never stay in a home like this. Jesus did. And just a few chapters earlier in Luke 8, 1 through 3, Luke had said that Jesus and his 12 disciples were going from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people. And then Luke says, and there were some other women with them. And Luke goes on to list these women by name. And then at the end of it, he says, these women were picking up the tab. He says, they were supporting Jesus in the ministry. So Luke feels that it's important that we know that women were traveling with these men, again, something that they didn't do in that day and age, and that they had the money that, were, that they were paying for the food so they could go on the road and go from village to village. And Luke wants everybody to know this, you know, that there's women with the men traveling. They didn't do that unless they were family. And and now they're staying with women. And they would never stay with two unmarried women unless they were family. And even more, you know, Luke wants us to know that this whole Jesus movement began not just among men, but men and women. Something had changed. And what's going on here is there's this new kingdom. There's this new social order that, that Jesus has started. That's what his kingdom is about. Where there's neither male nor female, nor, nor you know, Greek or, or Jew or slave or free, you know, everybody is the same and the world is changing. So here's Jesus at the home of two sisters and it says that one of them is sitting at his feet. And I mean, sitting at, your, at someone's feet, that phrase doesn't, isn't just describing how they were sitting in the room. This is a technical term that's used to mean when you're sitting at someone's feet and the person is a rabbi, what this means is that you are a disciple. And in their day and age, I mean, rabbis would just take a few disciples and he would pour out his life into them. And there never, ever were any, any female disciples. Never. Until here. And here is Mary at the feet of Jesus. And what that means is that he is teaching her just like she were a man. Mary's like a man being taught by a rabbi. She's a disciple. And of all the, again, all the Jewish historical records, never once is there a female disciple mentioned, none until Mary. And Jesus made himself available to everyone, not just males, but females, and not just, you know, it was old and, and young and Jews and Gentiles and sinners and saints, and everybody has the same access to him and has the same invitation of, won't you please come follow? Well, can I pour out my life into you? And they would go where he went. His disciples would live with him. They would, they would sleep around him. They would eat with him. They would observe how the, the master, how the rabbi did life. 
so they could be like the rabbi. And this is what Mary is doing. So as the, the evening uh, you know, progresses, Martha, the older sister, is preparing the meal and she is, as it says, distracted. Now that doesn't mean that she's got a text or whatever. It just, it just means that uh, what that means is that what's going on in the other room okay, has her upset. And to be distracted... You have to be distracted from something by something else. And Martha is distracted from being at the feet of Jesus like Mary by her duties, by cooking. And she doesn't really need someone to peel potatoes. Martha is upset because her little sister is in there with those men at the feet of Jesus and I think what Martha, if we could get inside her head here and just kind of read between the lines, she's thinking, oh, this is so disgraceful. Huh. What's going to happen after this? My, my sister's, may, maybe she's going to leave town with these guys. And, and what's the village going to think? What's, what about our reputation? What about our family name? And who's going to marry my sister after this? This is scandalous. This is terrible. And that's why Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about so many things, but just one thing is necessary. And we can hear his compassion there, Martha, Martha. And, and then he diagnoses the, the situation so with such pinpoint accuracy. He says, what keeps someone from his presence is not just busyness. That isn't it. It's not how busy you are. Uh, no one is really too busy. We're never too busy to be in his presence. No one is too busy for Jesus. The problem is this distraction. Jesus says one thing is necessary. Just one thing. I don't know if you're like me or not. I, don't we wait for that one thing? I mean, that one thing. This, this, how many one things are marketed every day? This is just the one thing that you need. This is the one thing that your life lacks, is you lack these clothes, or you lack this car, or you lack this job, or this lover, or this song. Or it, the, the list just goes on and on and on. I just need this one thing, you know, and that's, that's American marketing to us, and it goes on and on until we have a million of those one things, and each one is promising to be the one thing that's finally going to, to fill that need that we have, but, but none are the one thing. And Jesus says, I've got the answer. I, I know the one thing. I know the only thing that's necessary, Martha. And here it is, Martha, you can be my disciple and you can cook the meal too. Those two things are not competing today. Martha, you need the one thing and that is to choose to live continually in my presence. Whether you're cooking or no matter what you're doing, to be in my presence. Martha, would you make me the center of your life? You see, would you make me the one thing? Now, notice that Martha was not distracted by bad things. She wasn't breaking any commandments, was she? She was not sinning. Martha is a very good person. Martha is an exemplary person. Martha is the kind of person you, you say you want your daughter to grow up to be like Martha. She did the right things, but she didn't do the one necessary thing. She was distracted from the one thing because of so many other good things. She was nervous and she was anxious. And I don't miss that connection there. She's nervous and she's anxious because she's missed the one thing. She's, she's anxious. She's worried about her fish. It's going to be dry. Her matzo ball soup's not going to taste good or something. It's not going to turn out. And she's missing the eternal Lord who's there in her house that moment. And she's worried and she's anxious. And Jesus is the antidote. He's the answer right there. And if she had been chosen, if she had chosen the better portion than this other portion, she would still be fixing dinner and she'd have the one thing. If she would said, I want him as the center of my life. I want him as my Messiah. 
Jesus pushed her to define the relationship. And she knew after he said what he said that she had missed it. Now, if you follow the story, Mary Martha on, it gets better and better. You know, well, well let me just give you a hint because we're not going to preach this. The last night that Jesus was on earth, you know where he spent every evening? With Martha and Mary. Every evening. He came out of Jerusalem and went to Bethany, stayed with Mary and Martha. His last night's on earth. So he doesn't turn his back on her. And we know that she comes along. It just takes her a little bit longer to figure out what that one thing is that, and it's, that's Jesus. And I just think today, what, what are the things that keep us from living in the presence of Jesus? I mean, if that's the one thing that's necessary to be completely and totally focused on Him every moment of every day, there are millions of distractions, the most of them very good things, not bad things, but there's still distractions that take us away from the most important person. And we have this myth that lives that only do the do-nothing people can be in the presence of Jesus, and I think it's just a myth. All of you action people, man, you can be in His presence presence too by just choosing the, the best thing. I think of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Most of us know this scripture. Paul tells the church at Thessalonica at the end of his letter to him, he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all, underline, all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now that doesn't mean to pray without ceasing, that we go all around with our eyes closed all day, that we never leave the house, and we're in our prayer closet all day. It means that as we go about all of our day, that there's constantly prayer in us. That it begins first thing in the morning, and it only ends as we go to sleep. And for a lot of us, we even pray in our sleep. It's completely prayer without ceasing. See, some of life we get to be in the room with Jesus. We get to be at church, okay? And most of life, we don't really get to be in that room physically, but we're at work, okay? Or we're in the kitchen. And our, our kitchen may be an office cubicle, or it could be a factory, or a classroom, or a car, or a truck, or a home with children, you know? But the kitchen is, metamor metaphorically here, the kitchen is our place in life where we're worried and upset over so many things, but, but what if we decided and learned how to be at the feet of Jesus, to be a disciple who is focused on Him and still do those other things at the same time? This isn't an overnight fix. This takes a long, long time. I have not achieved it myself, but I strive towards that goal, to live in His presence. But you got to start somewhere, don't you? And I think the first thing is to realize that I'm living a distracted life. That I thrive on the distractions that keep me away from the most important person in the world. It's going to take a long time to get there. It could take 10 or 20 years. But it begins with the realization that we are, in fact, missing the one thing. John Lennon is quoted often as saying that life is what happens while we are busy making other plans just slips by us you know and I thought about this I want to close with this here today what what if at death and this isn't real so don't go write in a book on it uh, what if at death if if we were escorted into God's media room really nice plush couch and chairs and you know great popcorn butter just ooze because it doesn't hurt then you know just butter all over we finally get butter and great big super drinks and you know uh, uh, milk duds that going old time you hear milk duds right milk duds and popcorn and you're going to watch a movie and the movie is what the movie is is that God has edited this movie down and he has captured every little well he didn't do it some of his angels did but every little snippet of life where, where Jesus Christ was the center of your life. Where you were totally focused on Jesus. And he's made a movie. You know? He's made a movie. Out of, and let's just even be gracious here. Let, let's say that, that as well as being focused on Jesus, that, that he included every little 
time in your life where you were totally present <laughs> with anybody. When you weren't distracted by anything, but you had your total focus was given to another person. So when they were saying something, you were really listening to them. You weren't thinking about something else. <laughs> okay, but we include all that in that movie. Now my question to us is, how long is that movie gonna be? It's gonna be like a six second bind movie? Is that what it's gonna be, you know? Or is there going to be this, this epic production with, you know, sequels? It goes on and on of a life that's lived totally undistracted, where you're focused on now. You're focused on Christ, and you're focused on what's happening now. Quite a challenge, isn't it? What a, what a, what a waste of life to, to get through it and then realize that you were never there. You were never there. But you were always thinking about something else, always being distracted by something else. See what I'm saying? So here's a challenge for you guys today. Let, let Jesus define your relationship with him today. Let him do that for you. Where are you distracted? What's the things that distract you the most in life? What is it that takes you away from where you want your heart and your mind to be? Let's pray. As deep cries out